wrote it quickly down, and I'm just going to share it. I have no, no idea how long it's going to take. Are we recording, Don? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to all those listeners at home. It's still morning, yeah. Good. So, Heavenly Father, I just come to you now. We are such a needy people, Lord. The battle is fierce. The battle is strong over our lives. And we look to you today knowing that you are a good God and that you are the God who desires to strengthen his people and encourage them to bring them hope to breathe life into us. I pray that these words now would strengthen us, Lord, and equip us for the struggles ahead, for the battles ahead, that our eyes would not fall down to the ground, but that we would keep on looking up, that we would have a hope, that we would go forward in the spirit of David, that we would see Goliath, we would see the enemy. We would know that this is not just a human enemy, but that this is a spiritual enemy, because this Goliath in our life, is standing up against Almighty God. And we run towards Him. We run towards our enemy. <laughs> Strengthen us, Lord, I pray. Strengthen us today. Give me the words to say, but more, Lord. I pray that you would reveal truths to us today. As we open our hearts and minds to you. Thank you, Jesus. I've been saying this to people all week and probably for a few weeks, really. What's on my heart is that this is time. This is time to be ready. This is time to get ready. So, <clears throat> don't worry, don't worry, Deborah. It's okay, don't worry, seriously. <clears throat> so, this is a time I feel for us to be awake, to waken up, to wake up to the, the times. I mean, this is a message I've spoken of, I've, I've touched on these things over and over again because it's a message in my heart it's not going away it motivates me it gets me out of bed in the morning it gets me on my knees it gets me into the word it gets me it keeps me away from discouragement it keeps me away from sin it there's a there's a, a seriousness that i feel over me at this time in my life there's so much coming against the people of god so much spiritual attack upon us and it's so subtle. We don't have a monster coming to our house to try to kill us. If we had, it would be easy. We would just rebuke it in Jesus' name. We would cast down a demon and command it out of our lives if we could see it. And so Satan comes subtly. He uses, he uses the flesh amongst us, amongst each other, to provoke us, not only against ourselves, but against each other. Many obstacles come against us. I've got two passages that was on my mind for this talk. Matthew 25, 1 to 13. And then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough oil for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were, who were ready went in with him 
to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. The problems that we are encountering in our lives, who's got problems, who have issues, who have stresses and pressures in their life? Yes, yes, me. These are opportunities that we have for the Lord to prepare us for the coming season. I'm telling you now, most of the pressures and the stresses coming against us, I believe, is a form of spiritual attack upon us. Busyness. Constantly things to do. We have to fight against that. We have to create space. We have to create management in our lives. There is a spiritual slumber and sleepiness coming against the people of God to dumb us down, to dull our minds, and to reduce our hope. That we just become so occupied and so over-concerned with the things in our current life and the pressures coming against us and we take our eyes off the Lord and we cease to make progress against the enemy in our lives. Satan has to stop the ministry that God has put inside us because the ministry he's put in you is not for you. It's nothing to do with you. It's for other people. For those that we encounter around us in our daily lives, at work, in a supermarket, on the street, neighbors, family members, in church to lift up the brethren and encourage us. You know, a fire gains momentum. It sucks in oxygen. It just starts to roar. It starts to grow. And the church is supposed to be a fire. We come to church. We gain, we get that the Holy Spirit is there. There's a multiplication of the people of God coming together to worship in one spirit, in truth, and in love. And we catch that fire and we, we receive that fire and we grow. There's a multiplication. But we need to be on fire ourselves. We have a personal responsibility to get ready. Because on that day, there will be no place for excuses. And God, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, God is not going to be interested in what we're talking about, blaming other people or blaming circumstances. Lord, did you not know how difficult my life was? Did you not know how down I became? Do you not know how, how I just, it took every ounce of strength just to carry on? It's not enough. It's not good enough. The Lord is going to require account of us. What did you do with that which I placed in you? What you placed in us, Lord? Well, what did you place in me? I went to church. What? Yeah, became a Christian. I had a testimony from 1997. Yeah. What do you mean? What do you mean placed in me? Well, God has placed things inside us. God has placed treasure ministry, plans and purposes. Because Jesus is not here physically today. But he's given us the helper, the Holy Spirit. And we are all, in a way, little Jesuses going around the world ministering. Of course, we're not Jesus. He is in heaven at this time. But physically, he's not here speaking to people. Physically, he's not here, as the centurion said, Lord, just speak the word and it will be done. Well, we're not going to say, Lord, you know, in this circumstance, just speak the word, Lord. No, God's saying, no, you speak the word. I gave you authority. I gave you authority to witness. I gave you a mandate to heal the sick. I gave you a mandate to go and bless your neighbor and love them. I feel that the spiritual attack upon us is that we get One of Satan's great weapons is to hurt you. You will be hurt. You will be put down. Life is not fair. Things are not fair. You won't be treated fairly. And even if you're not witnessing or proclaiming yourself a Christian, Satan is going to take great pleasure in treating you badly and in hurting you and injuring you and spitefully using you. 
And this, if we receive it and we run with it, will dampen us down. Because Satan is economical in his attack against us. He doesn't bring out the, the, the big guns to smash you to pieces. If he can just use a little bit and defeat you and stop you, stop you in your tracks, that's all he'll do. If he can hurt me and injure me so that I receive that, that unfair treatment in the workplace, in the family, in the home, in, in the church, wherever it would be, and I just become angry and bitter and consumed with the injustice of what I'm facing, then my anointing just gets switched off. I, I'm no good to praise the Lord or start witnessing to my neighbor because I'm just consumed with all of this stuff in my head. So we've got to get wise to what the enemy is doing. And if we get abused in this world, then we need to rejoice because we know that we're causing a problem to the enemy. If we get mistreated, if things don't work out, if we have deferred hope, doesn't that kill you? Deferred hope. Deferred hope. We're hoping for something in life. We're hoping for a relationship, a, some money, a breakthrough, acknowledgement. We're hoping for the ministry that I know God has given us to, to, to manifest and be there. And it doesn't happen. And there's a deferred hope. And it can crush us. And it can put us down. We need to be wise to these things. And use the attacks of the enemy to know that the flesh rises up and joins with the enemy. And it's an opportunity to die to self, for the flesh to die. To say, Lord, yeah, you know what? I ran with that. They, I was treated badly and I ran with it. Because it hooked my flesh. How dare they treat me like that? How badly? What do you think they're doing? How dare you, you, know, you abuse me? How dare you, you refer to the, to the shading of my skin in that way? And just, how dare you maybe rise up against it? And it's like... You know what, Lord, I'm going to get wise. I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm going to let it run off me like water off a duck's back. Because I have a holy calling upon my life. And nothing is going to be allowed to dampen that. Or for me to lose that. Does that resonate with anyone? Not everything, you can say I'm being over spiritual and say, oh, it's not everything is the devil. Well, the devil and the flesh, I, so I often struggle to know which is which, you know. Is it a demon in somebody or is, just, is it just their flesh rising up? If it's someone else, it's always a demon. If it's me, it's just the flesh. You know, it's, it's kind of like that, isn't it? But I, I don't know. You know, David Wilkerson, he's, he, he's shouted at his wife. They used to have arguments and he shouted at his wife and he said, you stop saying that. That is demonic. I'm not allowing it. It's demonic. He tells this story. And she screams at him. And they go to the separate parts of the house. And then he's sitting in his office fuming at his wife. Fuming. And the Lord said to him, David, why is it when she does something wrong, it's always demonic. But when you do something wrong, it's always the flesh. And it made him think about it. And then they had to make up. And they had a kind of a relationship like that. It was a fiery relationship. It's a bit like us, yeah? It's a bit like us. And when Jackie does something wrong... No, I'm not going there. <laughs> but it's like, I don't keep... What, what does it matter? <laughs> Amen. That's right. She's a good woman. Good wife. <laughs> She's a good cook. Look at the state of this. You know, it's her, it's her fault. That is her fault. Don't blame. Yeah. What am I going to do on Judgment Day? Lord, you know, I'm, what are you talking about me being obese? You know, it's, yeah. An insurance policy. Luke nine fifty seven sixty two. As they were walking along. Oh, so if you want to find it, Luke nine fifty seven to sixty two. <coughs> Luke nine fifty seven to sixty two. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. So they'd just come out of a, a charismatic worship time session with all the people and they're on fire for God and, 
I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. You know, our home is not in this world. And the people of this world invest and make plans for their lives in this world. And it's so sad. You know, they're concerned about where they're going to live next, their retirement, their this and that, the other. They're concerned with this world. And we need to be concerned with the next world. God has a place for us. We are, tr- we are sojourners in this world. We're travelers in this world. This is not our home. We have a home waiting for us in heaven, a literal house waiting for us in heaven. We need to fix that hope in our mind all the time. So no matter what happens here, it will only be for a brief time. And there's, hard, there's, there's hardships in this world. There's real hardships. There's real hardships. Some of us are longing for things. Some of us are longing, you know, we have many things, desires. We may have many wants and needs in this world. And if we focus on that, we just get overwhelmed. But we need to focus on heaven. Like whatever happens here, it's only for a brief time. The people of the world are preparing for this world and ignoring the next. Yet, without Christ, they are facing an eternity of torment in hell. How crazy is that? Look how great and skillful the enemy is that he's taken their mind off eternity and placed it onto this world now to be obsessed with this world, making themselves comfortable, doing what they want to do, without a care in the world for what God wants for them, where God wants them to be, just obsessed and occupied with their own lives, and ignoring eternity. And when we can even get drawn into that as Christians, even though we're going to have a place in heaven, we just waste so much time being occupied in this world. Jesus said to another person, come and follow me. The man agreed, But he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now this is really interesting. There were these discussions going along. We know that Jesus called certain disciples who immediately responded and followed Jesus. Now we have been called by the Lord and we have responded, which is amazing. But we need to just shake off any double-mindedness that we have. If the Lord calls us, there is no, there is no excuse. There is no time to wait. There is no time to become occupied in something that is not associated with that which God wants you to do. So we need to be in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing that God wants us to do. If you're not in the right place, what business do you have there? You've strayed away from the path that God has for you. And God has a path for us. I mean, me and Manu, we talked about that before Christmas. We were talking and I was saying that, you know, Psalm 91 applies to those who abide under the shadow of the Most High. With the promises of God, there are usually conditions. And it's not that God is saying, everyone's going to be taken care of. Everyone's going to be protected from from plague and disaster. Everyone's going to be okay. It's for those who abide under the shadow of the Most High. So if we're not under the shadow of the Most High, if we've wandered off, if we're doing something, if we are somewhere that we shouldn't be, we have to ask, wherever we are, is this part of God's plan for me? So if I'm working on a building site, that's God's plan for me. You know, God himself was a, was a builder. He's a, he was a, a joiner, a carpenter. He was on site. He was working. There's nothing wrong with that. He was, if that's the call of God upon your life, that's a good thing. If you're cooking in the kitchen or cleaning a toilet, if that's the call of God on your life, that's a good thing to do. We need to have clean, ordered houses. When we're having conversations with people, we're there on God's business. 
We may not always share the gospel, but we're there on God's business. So if the conversation spirals downwards into some place that, you know, we, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be a part of, we shouldn't be a part of it. We need to walk away from it. We always need to ask, what business am I doing in this restaurant, in this bar? What am I doing here? Am I here on the Lord's business or not? I don't know if I'm conveying this, but I just have a tremendous urgency that we need to get up to speed with the Lord, with our relationship with Jesus, and with the positioning that he wants to put in our lives. And everything is going to conspire against you. Everything is going to come against you to stop you doing that, including yourself. Everything is going to come against you. You'll be busy. You will have problems. You will have issues. The people around you won't be, they won't be convenient. Nothing's going to be convenient in our lives. It's a struggle. It's a fight. And we need to win that fight, but we need to wake up to that. I said to this to people, whatever you think about the vaccine, some of you take it, some of you don't. And I, I am absolutely at peace with both of those things. But when I took my vaccine, I, I fasted and I prayed and I felt the Lord say, it's okay. So I went and I took the AstraZeneca one. And when I came out, I stood on Withington Road outside the pharmacy. And I was just thinking, I said, Lord, you know, is this, is this vaccine okay? And it was a bit late to say that again because I'd already just had it. And the Lord spoke to me and said, the vaccine is not the problem, but something else is coming. So the vaccine, this is what God, I, it's subjective, what God, I felt God say to me. He spoke to me as I was standing on Withington Road. And he said, the vaccine is not the problem, but something else is coming. I don't know what that is. But it's scriptural. We know that terrible things are going to start to occur before, the, before Jesus returns. What does that something else mean? Another plague of which there is no vaccine. What does it mean? Um, war? Disaster? Economic crash? Where would the Christians be today if there was an economic crash? With our, with our pension plans and our saving accounts and our houses that we've invested in. And everything else we've got in our lives, if all of that was suddenly just taken away from us, where would we be? Where would we really be? Would we still be coming to church the next day and praising the Lord? Or would we be, would we, we be completely undone? Lord, I've worked so hard for this for 35 years. I've been working for this and it's suddenly gone and it's not fair. Where were you in this? Da, 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 da. Because where's our treasure? If our treasure is with Jesus those things are not going to impact us to destroy us. We know that our prosperity is in him. You know, it was a weird thing. They said in the concentration camps in, that the Nazis set up in the 1930s and 40s, the people that went into the concentration camps, the gypsies and the Jews and other people, it was the prosperous, it was the rich it was the educated, the well-to-do. The, they were the ones that died first. Because they never encountered the hardships that they faced in, these li in this life. Psychologically, they'd never, they'd never faced, they'd never experienced those problems. Being stripped naked, having everything, including their wedding rings, thrown into the mud, taken off them. Humiliated, degraded, treated badly. And it was those who were well off that just succumbed, they just collapsed psychologically, emotionally, and then physically, and they died. They were the ones that died first. And it was the, the downtrodden, the poor, those who had, had very little in life, they were the ones who, the majority of the ones that came through, it was among them that came through. And I just think there's a message in that for us today. I believe in prosperity. I believe in buying houses. I believe in saving up. I believe in, in all of these things. They're good things. It's part of the prosperity of the Lord, but it's not our treasure. Our treasure has to be our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be prepared to give all of that up at any time, to lose it all, and not to be undone. Difficult times are coming. Hard times are coming. And we will be required to do great exploits in the end time. And we need to be ready for that. 
So every problem coming against you in your life at this time is an opportunity to die to self, an opportunity to humble yourself under the hardships of life and to press into your relationship with the Lord and to grow stronger. There is, I believe, a testing time going on in our lives. I can see it visibly among some of us, a testing time. And the Lord is seeing if you are going to keep going. The Lord is seeing if you are going to endure. If you're going to walk out of your life. If you're going to give up. If you are, you know, I believe the Lord's favor is upon you and you still go to heaven. But the Lord won't be able to entrust to you that which he wants to. To bless other people. So if God has words, prophetic ministry, if God has pastoral ministry, if God has ministry that is going to impact other people, he needs to see that you are trustworthy to be able to place that ministry upon. But if you're going to choose yourself and give up, if you're going to be um, blindsided by the enemy so easily and just injured and taken out of the battle, God can't entrust that kind of ministry to you. So there is a preparation going on in our lives. Learn to love the hardships. Learn to love the abuse. Learn to love the difficult things that come against us in life. Because they are opportunities for us to grow, to put our roots down into Jesus. Because nothing makes me pray as much as being mistreated. It's great. You know, I I find myself on my knees crying out to God because often you've got nothing else. And you come through it. And you're still mistreated. And people still think badly of you. And it doesn't matter anymore. You, my, my, God has, is affirming me. And that's all that matters. But learning those lessons in life is very difficult. And you only learn those lessons by going into the fire and out of the fire. In back into the fire. I think the biggest spiritual battles we face are the long, continuous, daily struggles that we face. If we have a crisis, we can come through that. But it's the long struggles, the longings we have in our hearts. We see someone else being blessed in a certain way. And we think, oh my goodness, you know, that's, so much, that's, that's what I need. I need it. And we don't have it. And these are, these, it tests us, you know. I'm not going to go on too much longer. But Joseph was tested in prison. I think he stayed in prison. Um, it, it, from my reading, it's about 13 years that he was in an Egyptian prison. If you, if you want to disagree with that, that's okay. We can look at that together. But in my understanding, it was that he was in prison for 13 years without parole, with no lawyer, with no hope of ever coming out of that prison. 13 years. Why on earth was he in prison for 13 years on a charge that he hadn't committed? Having given dreams, you know, to interpreted dreams for two people who could have then helped him to get out of that prison and they forgot about him. And Joseph was tested. God tested Joseph. And the day came when his testing was over. And he woke up one day in prison and he went to sleep that night in, in the prime minister's bed. You know, amazing transformation. But God is watching and waiting and testing us at this time. I do feel for the church at this time, it's like a holding time. We're not making the great advances that we want to see. Revival isn't happening at this time in Manchester. There's a holding time. But God is watching to see who is going to stand, who is going to hold, who is going to remain faithful, who is going to stay awake, who is going to invest in oil right now, which is the Holy Spirit. Lord, Minister to me daily we get our Bibles open. Daily we spend time in prayer. And we receive from the Holy Spirit and we grow stronger. And we're ready. So that when the Lord comes we'll be ready. When the requirement of the Lord to go forward into ministry we're receptive. We hear the word and we go forth and we do that. I do feel that some of you have amazing ministry in you. All of us have ministry, but some of us are going to be very visible. We're going to be at the forefront. We're going to see amazing things. We're going to suffer tremendous persecution. And we're going to know the Lord and we're going to injure the enemy and his kingdom so much. We're going to humiliate the devil in what he's trying to do in this world. 
by the words that we speak and by the power in which we go forth. So, I think that's all I've got to say. Let's be encouraged. Invest in the Lord. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would rest on each one of us now. That you would give us your thoughts. We've had enough of our own wisdom. We've had enough of empty words in our lives, of empty thoughts and empty plans. Investing in this world which is soon going to pass away. Lord, may we be people who invest in eternity. May we be people who endure the hardships because we have a heavenly mindset. Because we know that even when things are cruel in our lives and difficult, it's an opportunity for the flesh to rise up that it may be dealt with. That we can die to self. That we can choose every moment and every opportunity in our lives to follow you. Not to be distracted by the busyness of this life, by plans that we may, may make, even though those things may be good in themselves, Lord. If that's not the calling in our lives, give us discernment to know. Awaken us right now, Holy Spirit. Awaken us in our relationship with Jesus to the things of God and the, your purpose in our lives that we may use our time well and that we may be ready. We choose to follow you, Jesus. Amen.